hello! I'm out here today in the forest of the North Cascades. It's a kind of windy spring day out here, and uh, the, the springtime has me thinking about something, and it has to do with this forest out here behind me. And we look back here, we see these miles and miles of dark evergreen forests, and I think about the fact that every single day in springtime, people walk through these evergreen forests without ever questioning how come none of these huge evergreen trees have really showy flowers on them? Seems like kind of a big question, right? Well, today we are going to look at a tree in our northwest forest here in Washington that does have flowers on it. And we're going to talk about why trees would have flowers in the first place and learn a little bit about this special tree and how it fits into this ecosystem. Today we're going to be looking at the Pacific dogwood, sometimes called the western dogwood. And before we get out into the forest to take a look at this tree in its natural habitat, we want to learn a little bit more about how to identify it if you come across it while you're out looking at trees. The first thing is going to be the flowers of the dogwood. This is a tree that has flowers, and they're going to be big and white and showy, sometimes up to six inches across. And you're generally going to find them in the spring, but occasionally even in the fall. Now the flowers of the dogwood, they have these really large white showy petals, and then they have smaller ones on the inside, but the secret is those large white showy petals are not actually, botanically speaking, flower petals. They're actually a specialized type of leaf called a bract. The true flowers are going to be in the center of that arrangement, and there's going to be a whole bunch of them grouped together on a small ball. If you find them outside of flowering season, the feature you're going to want to look for is going to be the leaves of the dogwood. They kind of taper off to a little point, um, and the really special identification feature is going to be looking at the venation. They have pinnate venation, which means one center vein with smaller veins coming off to either side. But the smaller veins of the dogwood tree are actually going to curve upwards towards the tip of the leaf, and they're going to run parallel to the edges of the leaf. If you take that leaf and you gently pull it apart in the center, you'll notice that where the veins are, a small white strand will be left holding the leaf together. That's a feature you're pretty much only going to find on dogwood trees, but remember, only take a couple leaves from these living organisms. The last feature of the dogwood that's really interesting in identification is going to be the wood and the bark. The wood of the dogwood is extremely hard and very tough. In fact, the name dogwood comes from the Old English dagwood, with a dag meaning a wooden nail. So the wood of this tree is so tough you can make nails out of it. And the bark is going to be a grayish whitish color, and oftentimes here where I am in the Pacific Northwest, you'll notice lichen growing on it. Now we're going to go out there and take a look at this tree and learn a little bit about how it fits into the general ecosystem here. I'm out here in the forest now with my friend, the Pacific Dogwood Tree. And I know the first question you're probably thinking is, because these trees are so beautiful, where can I find them? So Pacific dogwood trees, they grow in a very broad range from British Columbia, Canada, all the way down into the Coast Range and the Sierra Nevada Range of California. This one right here is in Western Washington. And what these trees really, really like, even though they have that broad range, they like a specific habitat. And that habitat is going to be a cool, moist forest. You go to places where it's really hot in the summer, where it's really dry, chances are you're not going to see this tree, and you won't find it very much either in places where there's a whole lot of snow. There's another feature of the habitat that this tree really likes though, and we're going to take a look at how this one fits into the forest overall. So where this tree fits into the forest, everybody's got to have their place in the forest, right? Well, for the Pacific dogwood here, that is as an understory tree species. So let's break down what that means. The Pacific dogwood can only get up to about 30 or 50 feet tall at most, um, which is a lot taller than us, but it's pretty short for a tree. For example, here in Western Washington, where I'm filming right now, the upper canopy of the forest can be as high as 100 or even 350 feet in the air. So a 50 foot tree is going to be well below the canopy of those largest trees. And actually, that's where the Pacific Dogwood wants to be. There's a lot of good advantages to being down here in what we call the understory, the layer of plants and trees growing right down near the ground. One of those advantages is that little bit of shade that you're going to get from the upper canopy can actually help this tree avoid the worst of desiccation or drying out on a hot summer day because it's usually a lot cooler down here under the shade of the large conifers. Oftentimes, it'll have easier access to water. After all, the water is going to be coming from roots here on the ground. 
And I like to think that one more advantage of the Pacific dogwood being an understory tree is we as humans get to appreciate those beautiful springtime floral displays that would be awfully hard to see if they were 300 feet in the air. And of course, talking about that benefit of being able to see the beautiful flowers of the flowering dogwood reminds me that we have to answer why flowering dogwoods have flowers, uh, but other types of trees out here don't have flowers. Now, unfortunately, I am filming this a little bit late in the season to see the flowers on our dogwood friend right here. But uh, in order to describe why trees such as the flowering dogwood have flowers, we need to talk about angiosperms and gymnosperms, the two big types of trees in the world. And in order to do that, we need to jump a little bit into tree reproduction. Let's do a quick biology breakdown of how that's gonna work. <clears throat> so when it comes to reproduction of trees, I think the first thing we can agree on is that we should call it tree production because that makes more sense and now I've made a joke. But moving forward from that, there's a couple of ways which trees are gonna go about this. And the first way is going to be through clonal propagation or what we call asexual reproduction. The way that trees would go about this is through sucker growth uh, or even from growing off from a broken bit. So for example, trees like the aspen, they're gonna send up new trunks from an existing root system of a tree. Those trunks will grow into full-size trees and they're going to still be connected into that same root system. It's an entirely new tree, but it's genetically identical to the parent tree. In other cases, such as with the black cottonwood, for example, a branch of that tree might break off and fall in a place that is wet enough and has enough soil to grow, and that branch will, instead of just dying there on the ground, send out new roots, new leaves, and grow into an entirely new tree from the parent individual. But again, it is still identical, genetically speaking. That's why we call this clonal propagation. There's another type of tree reproduction, though, that ends up with a different end goal. The different end goal of sexual reproduction in trees is going to be having different genetic material from the parent tree, or in this case, the two parent trees. Now, why would you want to have different genetic material? Obviously, if you had a parent tree, that tree was doing well enough to have offspring, but there's a couple of reasons for this. The first thing is, if the entire population of the forest has the exact same genetic make makeup, if there is a disease that can attack one tree, that same disease will be able to attack all of the trees using the exact same weaknesses in that tree. If, however, the forest is composed of individuals with different genetic makeups, one of those trees or a lot of those trees, they might have some kind of resistance to that pathogen or that disease, whatever is attacking it, or they might be a little bit more drought tolerant in case the weather gets a little bit drier. They might be able to tolerate hotter growing temperatures. There's all kinds of reasons that you want to have a genetically different population and trees want to be in on that as well. So how does this all fit in with flowers? Well, that's what we're going to look at next. So here I am standing next to a Douglas fir tree and you're probably thinking of oh, this Douglas fir Theo, this is a video about the Pacific dogwood, why are you next to that? And I need you to bear with me because we're going to use this tree here to talk about the difference between angiosperms and gymnosperms. We've used those terms before to make it really simple, angiosperms are plants that have flowers and gymnosperms are plants which do not have flowers. Now, gymnosperms have been around for a lot longer. They've been growing into trees for at least 350 million years, and their tree, uh, sexual tree production strategy um, involves these trees sending their pollen, uh, the male pollen, out into the wind and just hoping that that pollen lands perfectly on a female ovule and fertilizing it and turning it into a seed. Now that seems like long odds, because if you're trusting the air to just send one single cell exactly where it needs to land, it's long odds, right? So gymnosperms like the Douglas fir here, they have to compensate by producing a huge amount of pollen, which takes a lot of energy to do. Angiosperms, on the other hand, they have a different strategy that avoids having to do that. So we arrive at the essential question of this whole video of why have flowers on yourself if you are a plant? Now thinking back to what we already know, we know that 
Trees, which sexually reproduce, have offsprings that have higher amounts of genetic diversity, and that genetic diversity allows them to survive in a broader range of environments and survive a broader range of pathogens and attacks as well. We also know from the gymnosperms that releasing your pollen into the air and hoping for the best isn't the, the most efficient way to ensure pollination or fertilization of another tree. So the thing that flowers really do is they allow for something else to do the work of that pollination and that thing is usually going to be animals. Now flowers are big attractants, they're bright, they're showy, and they'll bring in a range of animals not just limited to things like bees and beetles, but also things like mammals and birds. And in fact, the flowers of the Pacific dogwood are playing off of this hope as well. They are hoping that an animal will come by and visit those showy flowers, often which contain nectar, which even sweetens the deal a little bit more. And that while those animals are visiting, they're gonna pick up a little bit of the pollen and then fly off to another tree of the same species, deposit that pollen there and allow it to fertilize that other tree so that those trees can have an offspring that shares the genetic material of both trees, thereby improving its fitness. This more efficient way of pollination that angiosperms have developed with their flowers is one of the reasons that they're able to kind of be some of the more dominant tree species that we find on the modern world today. Now when I say that angiosperms are kind of the dominant tree of today's world, I don't mean to put down the gymnosperms here. One thing that's important to remember is that gymnosperms have their own really impressive adaptations that allow them to survive in this world as well. There are tens of thousands of species in the world today that are angiosperms, but there's also hundreds of species of beautiful gymnosperms out there. And nature really is a balance. All trees have something special to them. And so it's important to know that just because some have flowers and others don't, doesn't make the ones without flowers any less incredible. But I will say, I do love seeing those beautiful dogwood flowers up here every spring. The next time you are out in the forest, keep your eyes out for a Pacific dogwood tree and remember how this tree connects you with the rest of the ecosystem. Hi everybody. If you enjoy learning about trees and you want to help this page grow a little bit, you can get the chance to learn about a lot more trees and help this page grow by subscribing to this channel. Thank you so much.